You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! Hey, what's up, folks? I'm really glad to be talking to you this week, and I am super excited about this week's guest, which we'll get into in just a minute. But before I get started on that, I wanted to just... I just want to say thanks. Um, We've seen some tremendous growth uh, on the podcast side in the last six months, like... Like almost, you know, the almost as much as we've seen in the first uh, first few years. So that's that's kind of crazy to to think about and to see. And that's obviously, you know, more people are listening. That's thanks to you. You've been spreading the word and, uh, you know, helping keep the lights on around here. And I really, really appreciate that. I've got a lot of really cool guests that I'm excited to bring to you. And I'm excited that there are more people checking it out now than ever. So keep telling people, keep uh, keep. Keep telling people whatever you guys are doing, it's working. So please, uh, you know, tell your friends, family, coworker if they are into guitars and nonsense. This is a show for them. So uh, without further ado, I would like to get into this week's episode with Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater, somebody who probably needs no introduction to Gearheads. He's been the face of Sweetwater for, a, or one of the many faces, but kind of the guy that a lot of people think of because he's done so many videos and interviews over the years. Um, but he was just as amazing to talk to as you imagine, and his story's really cool, and I think you're going to enjoy this episode. So, we'll get right into it. Here's Mitch Gallagher. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, a show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Wylan, and with me today, I have Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater and a whole bunch of other stuff. How's it going yeah, on, man? It's going great, man. How are you? Ah, uh, this is exciting. I told you this right before we started recording. It's like, it's kind of, it's kind of trippy because like, oh, I've been watching this guy, like, tell me about gear for like ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I appreciate that. Thanks for, for checking out videos like that stuff. I've been doing it for a while. You have, you have. I feel like it's a similar feeling I had when I I recorded the first time I recorded with Andy Martin from Pro Guitar Shop. It's like I've been watching you for so long, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny you see people on YouTube, and it's almost like you're you've known them for all those years. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's it's similar to the with the podcast stuff, except that most people don't know what you look like. So right, a, you can slide under the radar a little bit better at Nam. Right, nobody but. recognizes you when you're out and about, right? <laughs> yeah, it's nice as long as I don't say anything. It's, uh, <laughs> can fly under the radar a little right, bit. Right, right. Well, let's jump right into it. You've got a long story, and you've got your fingers in more pies than I can keep track of. So maybe we should just start from the early days. You know, what made Mitch Gallagher pick up the guitar and end up being, you know, for all intents and purposes, the face of one of the largest retailers um, of musical gear in the world. That's uh, that's got to be a crazy story. It is kind of a long, twisty story. I never certainly never expected to end up doing what I'm doing. It's great. I mean, it's amazing. I never could have wished for, you know, something a, a cool gig like this. I mean, it really is fun. Um so I am from a, a small town in North Dakota, and there was not much music around, but uh, my mom was actually a singer in a vocal group with her sisters when she was a child, and so she always made sure we were we were into music. You know, I sang in the choir, I played trombone in junior high and, and in grade school, and and uh, you know did all that stuff until I was about 15 or so, or maybe a few years before that, but uh, I ended up getting pneumonia and was stuck at home for a couple of weeks. And being the wonderful mother that she is, she picked me up an album that I wanted, which was Kiss Alive that had just come out and um, and uh, I was, I was blown away. And I, I always say that's kind of what started the whole thing was, you know, Ace Freely and, and uh, all the stuff that he was doing on that, that album. And uh, so I, I got, I worked summers for my dad in his plumbing shop 
and saved up my money and bought a Encore Les Paul copy and a little tiny little Regal amplifier, I think it was, and uh, started trying to teach myself how to play and uh, put together some bands. My brother played drums and later bass, and so we had some bands out in the garage and, and did that whole thing. And uh, I ended up going to uh, college right out of high school, initially to study electrical engineering. Um, I thought I would design amplifiers and effects pedals and things is what I where I thought I'd end up. Um, college just wasn't my thing at the time, so I actually ended up uh, leaving college and going on the road with a band. Uh, it was a cover band that played all over the upper Midwest and, uh, you know, rock band. And did that for a couple of years and then ended up shifting over and playing in a country band that toured all over, again, the upper Midwest and Canada and, and uh, all through, you know, everywhere from uh, Green Bay to, uh, to uh, you know, up, up into Winnipeg and all, all over that area. Um, and then, uh, you know, got a little tired of being on the road and, and doing that and not feeling like I was getting anywhere. So I went back to college this time to study music and uh, got a degree in music. Started playing classical guitar, studied uh, electric guitar, studied composition, and uh, went to graduate school in Kansas City, uh, where I my major was uh, music composition. Uh, I was working on a master's in music composition with classical guitar as my, my primary instrument, and uh, playing in bands, and I had a home studio. I was running live sound. I worked in a music store there for a while. Uh, so I was doing a lot of stuff, all the stuff you do, you know, when you're uh, when you're a musician and you're going to school and you're, you're making ends meet. I was kind of doing all of it teaching lessons. I taught a lot of lessons, both when I was in college and when I was in uh, grad school. Um, but I saw this little ad in the back of Mix Magazine. It was just a tiny little ad, a couple inches, uh, for this store that was looking for uh, salespeople. And I contacted them, and it turned out it was uh, this uh, new company called uh, Sweetwater in Fort Wayne, and this was 1992. And uh, I came up and interviewed, and uh, ended up getting hired. I was the fifth sales engineer that that stuck. There had been a couple of people who'd come and gone in the meantime, uh, but I'm employee number 30 for the company, uh, which at wow. that point was, yeah. So it's, at that point, the company was about 15 years old, but, uh, well, 13, 13 years old, but the first number of years were all studio before Chuck got into the retail part of the, uh, part of the story, uh, where he was doing mobile recordings in his VW bus. And, uh, and so I was one of the very early salespeople there, uh, in a tiny little building, there were about 20 of us in the company at that point. Like I said, I'm employee number 30. And uh, I did that sales for a while, but um, it really wasn't wasn't my thing. Uh, so I moved more into the marketing end of it. I did uh, the first Pro Gear catalogs. I started the blog that still goes today. It's called InSync. Um, I started doing classes for the other sales engineers. Uh, we call that Sweetwater University now. All this stuff has evolved so much since, since those very early days. Uh, but... Uh, I ended up again, I saw an ad in a magazine, a uh, keyboard magazine. They were looking for an editorial assistant. And I didn't even know what that was. But man, when I was growing up, I just anxiously waited every month for guitar player and keyboard to show up in the mailbox. And I just devoured those magazines. I thought, man, it'd be so cool to work for a magazine and do that whole thing, you know. Um, and uh, so I contacted them and talked to them. And uh, they said, well, you're way overqualified to be an editorial assistant, which is just kind of an office assistant kind of position at, at that magazine anyway. Um, but we're looking for a technical editor. Would you be interested in that? And so I flew out to San Francisco and interviewed with them and ended up getting the gig as technical editor at Keyboard Magazine in 1998. And, uh, did that for a couple of years, and that was just amazing. I got to work with all these people. I've been reading their articles for years. It was just, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was, man, I was in heaven. Um, and in, uh, But in 2000, another magazine. Real, that I was, real quick, I got a quick question. Was this while you were still doing things for Sweetwater or is this, no, no I, is I this left a, a shift? Yeah. I left Sweetwater in 98 to go okay. to keyboard out in San Francisco. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, I didn't know everybody's uh, juggling a lot of balls oftentimes in this industry. Like you talked earlier. So yeah, I wasn't right, sure right. if you were wearing no, two I, hats. Yeah. I, I did uh, shift out there and I left on great terms with them, uh, which as we'll see, we'll, we'll play into what happens later. But uh, <laughs> the, the same company owned a magazine called EQ magazine, which is a very popular recording magazine at the time, recording studios. And I ended up becoming the editor in chief of EQ, which was based in New York. So I moved out to New York in 2000. And I uh, took over as editor in chief there, um, which was just super cool. Uh, getting to go to all the studios and have all the manufacturers and, and uh, you know, met a lot of artists. And, uh, and it was just, man, that was just a blast. And so I did that for a few years. I came to a point where I wanted to own a house. And so I, uh, I couldn't afford to do that in New York. 
So I moved to Nashville. I kept the job at EQ, but moved to Nashville and did it remotely. And I uh, met my wife while I was there and had a nice studio and did a lot of uh, that kind of stuff while I was there. Didn't do a lot of playing, but I was doing uh, more of the studio stuff and, of course, the magazine. And uh, we moved to Atlanta for a bit. And then the magazine industry took a big dive down, continues to kind of take a dive down. But at that point, it really, really took a dive, especially the music magazines. And uh, the corporate aspect of it kind of took all the fun of it out of it for me. And so uh, I contacted Chuck back at Sweetwater and said, man, you know, just checking in, see if there's any opportunities. And he's like, oh, you should come and do what you do for the magazines, but do it for me here. Do it for Sweetwater. And so in 2005, we packed up from Atlanta and moved back to Fort Wayne. And I started my second round at Sweetwater uh, as the editorial director. And when I first came in in 2005, it was to basically oversee the publication. So basically what I was doing for the magazines, you know, write articles, edit everything, proofread everything, do all of that. Uh, but in 2009, um, we decided we wanted to stick our finger in the water and test this whole video thing on YouTube. And so we did the first couple of videos out of my office, actually. And uh, they're pretty painful to watch at this point when, <laughs> whenever I see it. So <laughs> you can imagine, right? And oh, yeah. So, so I've been doing uh, uh, videos for Sweetwater ever since. I do uh, uh, all kinds of product demos. I interview all of the artists except for drummers, the drummers, uh, Nick DiVergilio, who's our drum expert, uh, tends to interview them, which is uh, you know, obviously a better fit. Um, I also interview producers, engineers, and, and those type of people as well and do a lot of product demos. I get to check out a lot of new products and product launches and things and go to the trade shows and cover all those. And so uh, I, I do that. I also write articles for Sweetwater. Uh, some of the social media stuff. So, man, I just have a blast. I, I, I always tell people, like, man, I'd hate it if I actually had to work. But it's, I mean, I, I go to work, and I, <laughs> I play with toys, I talk to cool people, and I write about it, and I do videos about it. I mean, how how, how much of a job is that? That's not work, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I feel yeah. similarly at times, like right now. Like I told my wife, like coming out to the studio, I'm like, okay, I got to go. I got to go do some work. You know, right. I told my son and wife and it. And, you know, I, every time it's like kind of get like not an eye roll, but a little bit of a, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. sure you yeah. are. Yeah, work like, quotes, uh -huh. right? It's always in quotes, work. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going to go talk to somebody about guitar stuff for an hour and a half. That's what you're going to go do. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fun. I mean, we work hard at Sweetwater. We have a good time there. Uh, Chuck Gates great, takes great care of us. I mean, it's an awesome place to work. And so I, I just, I'm so grateful every day when I get to go, uh, get to go in there and do what I do. It's really a blast. So that's kind of the, the work side of the story. Along the way, I wrote seven books. I uh, also did an instructional DVD on mastering for studios. Uh, I've, I've done a bunch of, uh, appeared on panels and discussions and done speaking at different things around the world and, and those types of things as well. So, man, the music industry has been really good to me. It, it's just been so much fun. That's that is very interesting. Like it, it's it's like I, I know, you know, I know you from from the Sweetwater stuff. And then like when you sent me uh, that email and it was like, what are all these things he's also done? Like I had to I was like, I don't have time to even like explore all these hundreds of things. I You have a whole nother facet to you that I uh, that I didn't know. Yeah. But of course, I went I went right to the album, of course, is where where I'm going to go first. And okay. uh Cool, yeah. Your background your background makes sense with the music because I'm just like, man, this stuff is very good. Like on a technical level and a and a and a production level and everything. And now that you explained all that, it just kinda all comes together. Like oh, cool. ah, yes, this is why it all sounds this way. Right. Um right. But what one thing I when you said you you're talking about you wrote a you were writing stuff on mastering, it instantly clicked something in my head. Is there a simple way that you can explain mastering to dummies like me who just, I played the guitar and the sound comes out speakers. That's what I, that's what I know about it. <laughs> so like, I know what mastering sounds like. I know the basic concept behind a well-mastered record, but I don't really understand the process at all. Is there a, a layman's version you can drop on the listeners? Well, there's a couple different ways to, to think about it, but these days mastering is more kind of the bridge between the end of what happens in the recording studio and when it's actually delivered to the listeners at the other end. So there's some processing that goes on. A lot of it is involved with trying to make the uh, mix what you call transportable. So it'll sound good no matter where you listen to it. If you're listening on earbuds or you're listening on an audio file system or in your car or whatever, you want it to sound good in all of those and sound consistent in all of those. Um, and so a mastering engineer, uh, their expertise 
is is achieving that that consistency as you move from platform to platform. Um, and it involves getting the levels right so that as you go through an album or an EP or whatever, the songs, one isn't super loud and one isn't super quiet. And so you're competitively loud, hopefully without distortion. They also make EQ adjustments so that the bass is going to be right. For example, that's what's always hard to get accurate when you're in the studio is how do you how much bass how much low end do you put on everything and so the mastering engineer will have a system that allows them to hear way down low and they know what it should sound like um, and so they uh they uh tweak the final mix they kind of smooth it out polish it not in the sense of making it slick sounding necessarily unless that's what you want but they polish it so it's ready to be delivered to the listeners and it's going to be a finished production for them as opposed to what comes out of the recording studio Gotcha. Yeah, because like mixing makes sense. I've I've watched that process and I kind of understand like tweaking individual levels, but I've always been kind of amazed. It's like they just get like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you just get the stereo tracks to work with? You don't really have much else. Is that is that right? Usually you get the the mixes that come out of the studio. So it's it's finished as far as the studio engineer, the mix engineer is concerned. Uh, but then there's that last five or 10 percent that makes it sound like a professional release that's finished for the masses to listen to but yeah it's and usually it's off of the stereo masters sometimes there are a few mastering engineers who work off of what are called stems and so they'll ask mm-hmm. you, they'll ask you to provide a stereo drum mix a stereo guitar mix a stereo with all the vocals and a stereo mix of the bass and the keyboards then they'll kind of put that all together and uh and then they can do a little bit more intensive processing in some cases that might be useful most mix engineers prefer to do the mix the way they want to hear the mix and deliver that. And mm-hmm. so 98% of the time, it's probably a stereo mix that the uh, mastering engineer is working on. Wow. That's that's really impressive to me because I've been struggling with, um, I've been just getting into, so I've recorded stuff for years, but I you know have my friends that know what they're doing. And I just, I just play the power chords, you know? Uh, right. <laughs> and, and so... As much as I obsess over every nuance and detail of my guitar rig, I never really paid too much attention to exactly what was going on in the recording process. I, not as much as maybe some people might have thought that I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I've been trying to do more demo videos and things for Instagram and all this other stuff. And I've, I've gotten much, much better at recording guitar sounds, but I'm still struggling with exactly what you talked about. It sounds great in my headphones. It sounds terrible through the iPhone speaker. Usually, is is, this, yeah, right. is the the situation I'm running into, and so I'm kind of like pulling my hair out. So the fact that that a good mastering engineer is able to get consistency across all platforms while only having two tracks to work with is pretty amazing, really. To me, yeah, yeah they tend I, to have uh, they tend to have really powerful tools. Most of them nowadays work both with really high end analog equipment and also really high end digital equipment. So the combination of those two lets them either be super surgical to fix problems or kind of uh, take a broader processing approach. So between the two of those, they can dial it in. Got you. That's very interesting. And then they also uh, they they also uh, but just to wrap it up they also will like my mastering engineer that I use Scott Hall at MasterDisc he delivered me a, a final master that was optimized for CD one for streaming one for uh, you know made for iTunes and one for uh, general downloads as well so you can kind of optimize the experience for whatever format people are listening to. Oh, right. Yes, right. Because I remember we we talked about trying to do vinyl and it was like, well, do you want to mix for vinyl? Because we got way too much bass in here for the, for that right now. And I was like, uh, I don't know. Like, what do I know about it? <laughs> right. I are a guitar player. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do what sounds good. That's what I always say. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So you brought up the 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 digital and analog thing, and you've been around to see both like, you know, especially being at Sweetwater, like you have a, a range of experience there where you've seen just about every piece of gear under the sun. And yet the debate still rages on whether you're talking about recording gear or 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 guitar gear or any kind of music gear, analog versus digital. Right. And I I personally find it to be a silly debate these days. What's your take on it? You know, it's, um, I get asked that question a lot and, um, each of those different, uh, technologies does what it does very, very well, right? Analog has its thing. Digital has its thing. And to me anymore, I I don't think about it that way. I tend to think what tool is going to do the job best for what I want to achieve. And so if I'm looking for 
particular saturation and a richness and, you know, thick bottom end and some beefiness. Maybe I want to run through a piece of analog gear that has transformers in it. Uh, if I'm mm -hmm. looking for more clarity, if I'm looking for more, more options, more flexibility, I need recall. I want to do more editing, all that kind of stuff. Digital, obviously, you, you know, they, that just dominates in, in that area. Uh, when I did the EP, it's a combination of both. There's some digital stuff. There's some analog stuff. So I, I think you use what does use the piece of gear that does the job. It's a tool and I kind of don't care anymore if it's analog or digital. Really not important to me. <laughs> yeah, you feel like I do then. It's yeah. just like, yeah, does it work? Does it do what you're trying to make it do? Right. Then then, then that's the one you use. If it's right. not doing what you're trying to make it do, there's other stuff. Right. <laughs> like Yeah, and if um, you're having if you're having to struggle too hard to make it happen, then maybe it's not the right tool even though it seems like it might be. Does that make any sense? It does. And it's just because, and just because it was the right tool for somebody in some situation that's similar to yours doesn't mean that it's going to work for your ears or fingers or whatever, you know, we're being very broad, but like whatever you're trying to do, that's exactly right. Just because it worked for, you know, a famous producer doesn't mean it's going to work for you. That's like, exactly right. That, yep. Yep. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, I think people um, forget how, how subjective all of this is. Some people act like it's objective, right? And it's it's not really, at least not in my experience. Right, very rarely, very rarely. Maybe in maybe with particular things, but that that's pretty rare, as you say. Yeah, yeah. So this is something this is something you probably get all the time. But let's let since you've had such a a crazy combination of experiences in the industry, and you landed in a rather unique place. Uh, what advice would you have? For a young musician looking to break into break into the industry somehow, like I think everybody gets caught up in their head that if you're a guitar player or, or a musician, that you're going to be that in a band. And I don't. I think I think a lot of people forget there's a million different ways that you can break into this business. What What would you say to a young musician who is just getting started? Oh man, uh, the more you know, the better off you'll be. And it's great to be a, a specialist in one particular area, but it seems to me the people that I see that succeed seem to have a broader knowledge of that. At least they have a cursory knowledge of a wide range of different related topics, right? So even if you're uh, solely going to be a country chicken picking guitar player, that's your goal in life to do that. It doesn't hurt to know a little bit of, of uh, harmonic minor scales and shredding and, and how to play a little jazz and how to play a little bluegrass and, and uh, how to play a little pop rock and how to, uh, you know, how to do a wide range of things. And also, like we were talking about earlier, understand how to record and understand how the technology works. And I mean, I got a lot of work along the years just because I was always a guy in the band who understood how the PA worked. And I could plug, <laughs> it, I, you know, I could plug it in and make the thing work and nobody else knew how. And so, you know, I could get jobs as a sound man. Even though I wanted to be a guitar player, I could do jobs as a sound man. When I was in the band, I was that much more valuable to the band because I could do that, that side of it, the tech kind of side of it and things. And that's just one example. You know, when I, when I came up, I, I wanted to be a player, but I saw the value of being able to teach a wide variety of different things of being able to do a little recording. I made demos for other musicians. We did, uh, I did a lot of recording in, uh, in, when I lived in Kansas city, my studio there, I did, um, sound alike songs. So the local radio station would make parody songs. They'd ask me to basically re-record the hit of the day and then they'd put new vocals on it, you know, parody vocals or whatever. <laughs> and so I did a right. bunch of those and you wouldn't believe how much I learned doing that about the way that songs work and the way that arrangements work and the way that recording works and you know, all, all that stuff um, that all these years later I still use every day. So it's, it's funny how the little things that you do along the way, all that adds up to where you end up if you will. Um, and, uh, the other part of that is that, uh, almost never say no, unless there's a compelling reason to say no to an opportunity. You know, you, you probably are going to benefit from it in some way, you know, unless you just absolutely hate the people or they're, they're just taking advantage of you, or there's, there's some other ugliness associated with it. I mean, an opportunity is an opportunity, if nothing else, a chance to learn something. And so, uh, you know, yeah. that, all yeah. that, that and curiosity about what's going on, that that's going to benefit you most, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's all, that's all really good advice, honestly, kind of regardless of what business you're trying to go into. I feel like yeah. that, that can, that's universally applicable to just about anything. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, 
it, it seems like those that are those that are kind of more open to just open to hearing about things tend to get to do more cool things. And it doesn't really matter what 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 that uh, what that particular field is. I, I it seems to me. I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And people want to work with people who are interested and curious and, and want to learn. You know, you want to work with mm-hmm. people like that, right? They tend to be more fun to be with. And you learn something, too, even working with somebody like that. So That's true. That's very true. Thank you for that. That was that was uh, insightful, I think. Oh, sure. So you've been you've been a guitarist for a long time, and it seems like you've you've played or touched everything under the sun because you work at Sweetwater. Right. How has that like impacted the way you assemble like a rig? I know we all kind of think differently about how to how to s- put together a guitar rig. Where some people use clean pedal platforms, some people use a lot of amp gain. How do you generally go about you know searching for a sound? Wow, um, I've changed my approach in the last couple of years. For a long time, it was never true, but I always thought of myself as a studio guitarist. And I don't know why, because I never really did a lot of that. I did some, but not a lot. And so I always tried to both in my studio gear and my guitar gear to be able to cover everything. Right. So I had all kinds of different amps and all kinds of microphones and all kinds of stuff for doing just in case. I always had a just in case rig. Uh, But the past few years, I've really focused it much more on what I actually do. And I've been a lot happier with my rigs ever since I've started doing that. Um, So for me, there's a tight relationship between feel and tone. And so I've, I've got to find something that feels right in my hands and plays comfortably and that I feel like is resonating with me and then match the rest of the gear to when I'm you know, talking about the guitar and then match the rest of the gear to that. And I have a much more specific idea of the tone that I'm going after now than I have in the past. And so that's, that's kind of shaped it a little bit. I don't, I don't know if all that makes sense, but, um, uh, I, I have gotten to where I've, I've tried to simplify my rig quite a bit. Um, I like to get as much as I can out of the amplifier itself um, and then enhance that with pedals. Whereas in the past, I've had some rigs where I've done the pedal platform with pedals, and that worked great too, and I did a ton of stuff that way. But just the way the pendulum is swung right now, I'm leaning more toward a, a little bit more uh, amplifier approach um, with uh, with some enhancements from pedals rather than the pedals being the driving tone. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn between two worlds right there. I used to be clean pedal platform guy almost exclusively and sort of maybe in a different way. I've, I've switched gears to where I'm, I'm, I use, I'm almost exclusively playing in stereo and I feel uh-huh. like I'm, I'm ruining myself by doing that because now when I plug in mono, I'm, I'm kind of unsatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's funny. Well, I, I will, I'm like, uh, I want to get, you know, this distorted. Like I've got this amplifier over here that I really like the distortion on. And then I really like to run my reverbs over into this cleanish amp. And it just sounds so much better to me. Like I've become kind of obsessed with stereo lately. And so I was, I was right. curious to see if, if anybody else is as obsessed as I am. <laughs> I actually <laughs> just, uh, I actually just ordered two new amps so I can and do a little bit more in stereo, but Another part of my focus with my rig the past year or so, I started doing some gigs to support the EP that I released. Um, mm-hmm. And what I was what I was finding is um, I need a scalable rig. So I need a rig that can go from a really quiet jazz type club. Like I'm playing on the 25th of this month and the stage is super quiet, just super quiet. I can't take my big amp in there, even with it switched to a lower power setting and a smaller cabinet and everything. It's just not going to work. So I've kind of put a rig together now where I can go from a 25 watt combo and it'll scale up to 100 watt amp with a wet dry wet, you know, 250 watt side amps with it mm, when I'm playing yeah. on a, when I'm playing on a big stage. So I can go from a 25 watt combo that I can turn down for a quiet gig. I can just switch that up to 50 watts for a bigger rig. I can run two of those and get stereo for a bigger rig. I've got a 100 watt amp that switches down to 50. That's kind of my big main amp, and then I can enhance that with the two wet. Uh, amps on the outside using those two stereo amps so with those three amps i can cover everything from 25 watts to a big wet dry wet rig and so i've I've been trying to put together this scalable idea that no matter what size of gig i'm playing i can still kind of have the sound that i want there so i know for a fact that uh myself and all of the nerds listening right now we just keep saying being very general what are those amps what'd you get the nerds want to know (laughs) so i actually have four amps so the the one amp that i i play a lot is a 
it's a 68 Fender Deluxe reissue that Paul Revere modded for me. And uh, Ooh. yeah, he did a he did the same mod that he used to do back in the 70s and early 80s for the studio guys in L.A. He calls it his stage two mod. And uh, it's a mod that Larry Carlton and, you know, uh, Lee Rettenauer and all those guys. It's the amp you hear on Beat It, actually, uh, with the, the stuff that Luke Couture was doing. So all those guys were using those. Uh, Paul Jackson Jr., those guys were using that amp back in that era. And so I, I got one of those and had him mod it to that for me. Uh, and I just ordered a pair of 50-watt uh, Fillmore's uh, from uh, uh, Mesa Boogie. They're 1x12 combos Ooh. that are 50-watt, mm-hmm. 50, 50 and then you can scale the power down. Uh, so that'll be kind of my center amp uh, for small gigs, and then I can run the two of those in stereo. And then my bigger amp um, is fairly new to me, actually. I, I've, I've played a Fuchs ODS for quite a while, um, uh-huh. but, I, but I recently uh, upgraded to an ODS-2, 100-watt ODS-2. Um, and it's, it's just a glorious amplifier. And so that'll be the center amp. And then the two film wars will sit on, sit on the outside and be the wet amps when I'm doing the really big rig. Mm, that sounds like so much fun. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Like, yeah. 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 But man, I did, I just, I kept finding myself in these situations where this amp is too loud for this. Mostly the amp is too loud for the gig that I'm playing by the time I turn it up to where it sounds good, you know? Uh, and, uh, yeah, and definitely. And when I went to a really small amp, I just wasn't happy with that because it sounded like a small amp to me. So, so I think this is going to let me kind of cover everything from really quiet, small gigs, grab it and go kind of situations all the way to big stages, which is strangely the range of stuff I've been playing the last year. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. What kind of guitars? What do you prefer for the actual guitar? Well, it depends. Um, I have, uh, for a long time, I, again, I tried to have like one guitar for uh, one of everything. Right. And I had like, I don't know, tons of guitars and I, I have scaled it way back. And so I've got, uh, the guitar I've been playing a lot is kind of a Frankenstein telly. It was, a really inexpensive telly that I bought just to have in my office at Sweetwater, just to kind of bang on when I was sitting there and strumming, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. but I, but I traded a friend of mine, a, uh, old pedal board for, uh, the neck off of an old telly that he had. And so it's a mid nineties, uh, custom telecaster not a telecaster custom but a custom telecaster was the the name of the model i think was what it was i'd have to go back and look to be sure um but it's a really cool neck and i had it refretted with big frets and a bone nut and you know did all that kind of stuff and and, uh so put that neck on that body and and it's got a uh duncan custom custom in the bridge and a little 59 in the neck and then i put a strat tremolo in it and uh so that's, that's kind of become a kind of become my main guitar for that type stuff although i also play a 335 quite a bit I've got a Larry Carlton uh, signature 335 from, oh, it's probably 2008, 2007, something like that. So that one comes out for those things too. Um, I've got a custom shop Strat. I've got a 59 Les Paul reissue. So, you know, I kind of have kind of the main food groups. Also got a really nice uh, PRS Modern Eagle too. So I rotate among all those and I just kind of grab the one that's speaking to me. But lately that Telecaster has been coming out the most. Yeah, that's that's been me too. Like I'm a I'm a Les Paul guy. Like been mm-hmm. playing Les Pauls for years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh but lately it's ever since I I did like a good cleanup and uh setup on my my Tele Custom, ironically, you know, flip-flop. But uh right. I can't stop playing that guitar. Like I'm just like uh, what's happening? Am I becoming a Telecaster guy all of a sudden? Like that would be weird. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, it but yeah, I just I, 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 love it. Mm. Yeah, it is funny. I had a, uh, in the mid eighties, I bought a Squire Telecaster. And in those days, that first couple generations of Squires were made in the Fender factory in Japan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they're, they were really great guitars, but I hated the neck on it. It had this huge baseball bat, maple fingerboard neck, which just is not my thing. Um, uh, and so that, that guitar hung on the, I mean, I played it a bunch and eventually I converted it to a 12 string. I think I put a warm mouth neck on it and and uh, converted it to a 12 string and had that for a while. Then I sold that neck and it just hung on the wall of the garage for about five years. Um, and the other day I saw that Fender is now doing these uh, uh, replacement necks and they're doing baked uh, roasted maple uh, replacement necks. And so I bought one of those and stuck it on that little Telecaster. And uh, man, that thing is killing now. I love playing it. It's just, it's, it's amazing. So you, you just great. never know. That's, oh man, I do. I have a thing for the roasted maple, you know, it's a good it's such a good feeling. I don't know. I like, I think it takes what I don't like about maple and gets rid of it. <laughs> this yeah, is I how I view the roasted. I'm a, 
I'm of the belief that the neck is the actually the most important part of the guitar as far as uh, the way that it resonates and generates a tone, at least with a solid body guitar. Um, just from changing necks around on different instruments and things, I, I just noticed such a difference when I put a different neck on. And those roasted maple ones seem to be, they're so stable and lightweight and they really ring. I love a guitar that rings almost like an acoustic, even if it's a solid body. And I like to feel mm-hmm. the neck really vibrate. If, if the neck really comes alive when I'm playing chords and, and playing uh, you know notes and stuff, then I feel like it's a guitar that's going to really perform well. If the neck doesn't ring when I play the guitar, I'm not interested. doesn't really connect with me. And everything I've played that has a roasted maple neck really rings like that. So there's there's something about it. I've got that Telecaster with that neck on it. I just uh, I got a Strandberg that um, is uh, living in my office right now. And uh, that has a roasted maple neck on it, too. And it's the same way, that neck just really rings and vibrates. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that. How do you like the how do you like the Strandbergs with the with the crazy, you know, all the craziness they have going on? You know, I was I was surprised. I, I have to admit that when uh, we were talking about bringing them into Sweetwater, we we uh, they, they joined the Sweetwater family a couple months ago. Uh, when they first brought them in, and I picked one up and played it, and I'd seen them at NAM shows too, and hadn't really played them, but I had seen them, and they you know they have that uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, not hexagonal, but the the neck is like three sided. Yeah, I don't right? trapezoid. Is it technically trapezoid? trapezoid? Yeah, I'm not I sure. Think it's a multiple yeah. trapezoid, something like that. Um, and so I I was unconvinced <laughs> until I sat down and played it. I was amazed how fast I adapted to it and how comfortable it became, how quickly. Um, I uh, studied classical guitar all those years. And so my thumb naturally kind of sits behind the neck a lot of the time when I'm playing anyway. And so with that mm-hmm. flat space on the back of those necks, it feels great. And they're super lightweight. They're, they're so ergonomic when you hold them in your lap and you're playing, you know, they, they sit so comfortably and you can put them at different angles and things. I've become a big fan. I'm loving, loving having that one in my office. I play a lot. I was so I was like you. I was like, eh, I don't know. But after uh, much persistence, a, a moderator in the Tone Mob Facebook group and uh, all around great guy, Jason has a uh, has a uh, convinced me otherwise. I played his uh, at an event here a couple of years ago, just briefly, and I, I had the exact same experience that you did. I was like, I cannot believe that I actually like playing this. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I was like, this is this. I looked at that neck and I was like, there's no way that's going to be comfortable. That, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's got angles. Like, how can it be right. comfortable? Nope. <laughs> Sharp edges, man. It, you don't even feel it. it. No, it feels great. It's it's crazy. And now I'm like, how how on earth have I went from the guy who laughed at headless guitars to jonesing for a Strandberg? Like, it's right. the things that have changed <laughs> in my life. Yeah. What have I become? The multi- the multi-scale uh, fretboard is cool too, I and mean, it does play so in tune as you go up the neck with those angled frets. And I thought that would take a long time to adjust to, but man, your hand really falls naturally to fit into those angled frets. In some ways, I think that's more natural for the angle that your hand sits at as you're playing chords and things high up on the neck than having straight across frets like you know most guitars have. Yeah, and I think the Strandberg ones in particular have have it, the angle right for guys like you and me who are used to straight frets and kind of that's how we think of things uh some of right. the uh, the more extreme versions that i've played they're a little bit too much for me if you're gonna be you know if you're not gonna be doing shred stuff and doing you know playing primarily single notes and like maybe some heavy distorted power chord type work uh and i'm not saying that they're i'm not saying that they can't work for everything i'm just saying for me if the strandbergs feel more optimized kind of for both sides of the fence that's just that's just my take on it i don't know if that's even I don't, I don't yeah. have enough experience with this that I should actually be giving my opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the six string one is, is much six string version is much more so that way, because by the time you get to the nut, the, the frets are basically straight and then they just mm-hmm. kind of angle as you go up. If you go to a seven string or an eight string, then they also angle the other way as you go back toward the nut. And so it's a little different experience, but if you're playing a seven or eight string anyway, it's a little different experience. And so I don't know, you just adapt to it really quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think Ola did a, a a great job. I like I I understand now what everybody's been talking about. I did not right. expect to talk Strandbergs with you. This is not a conversation <laughs> I anticipated. Sorry about that. No, it's, no, don't apologize, please, please. Yeah. But we do need to go. We do need to take a, a slight sidebar and go. We we kind of didn't talk about your pedals. Do you have some go to pedals these days, or things that have been staples for years, or what's your what's your board situation? So my current board, I actually, man, my board changes almost 
I hate to say it, almost weekly because there's just always something new coming in. I mean, I, I don't even know how many hundreds or thousands of pedals we carry at Sweetwater and I keep discovering cool stuff, right? And so um, it, it's hard not to, it, you know, working in a candy store, it's hard not to constantly be picking up new candy to try or whatever. <laughs> but it's, I, my board is, is pretty well, again, I, I haven't quite redone it yet because I'm working on this whole scalable thing of being able to go mono, stereo, and wet, dry, wet. And I'd like to do that all with one board. And I think I haven't figured out how to do it, but right now my board is basically mono or I can kind of patch around and get stereo with it. So with that said, um, I'm using one of the Friedman pedal boards that has the two levels. Um, I, I love that board. It's so solid. And I, I love the power supply that Dave Friedman does. And he has that buffer interface that, that has six jacks on it. So you can route in and out and, and do effects loops and all that stuff with it, which is super cool. Um, and so it's all on the, the uh, Friedman board and, and you come in. And uh, it goes through a uh, uh, Dunlop Mini Crybaby, the little tiny wah pedal. Mm -hmm. Because I rarely, I rarely use a wah, but it's nice to have one on the board for when I do use one. Uh, I was playing in a cover band for a long time, and, and we always did uh, Let's Get It On. That was the only song of the night I'd play a wah on, but you kind of need a wah to do that song, right? Pretty um, much, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so I've got the Mini wah on there. You hit that, and then it goes into a Boss ES5 uh, switcher. And uh, I've got a, uh, a Pigtronics Philosopher's Tone is my compressor. Mm -hmm. I really like that compressor. It's got a blend control on it, and it, it's not real obtrusive. I'm not looking for a super squished, squash thing. I'm just looking to even out the dynamics and, and kind of uh, add a little bit of sustain. Um, I use it, like, for two songs. And the latest addition is I just got a J-Rocket uh, Blue Note uh, Overdrive which I absolutely love. And I, I kind of think that's almost going to be on all the time when I'm playing because it just sounds so good. It's just, it's a really, really low gain overdrive pedal, but it has mm -hmm. a, a, this fat control on it. That's, that's really useful for shaping the lower mid range of a guitar. So you can fatten up a single coil or you can pull a little bit of the mud out of a humbucker or whatever. So, so that's, that's the overdrive that's on there. Um, I've got a, a TC polytone, which I always run in strobe tuner mode because it's way, way more accurate. I, any tuner I use, I run it in strobe mode if I can. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in strobe tuners. Um, and then after all that, uh, it goes to a Boss volume pedal. And so uh, that goes out into the front of the amp. The amp has two channels. The uh, ES5 changes the channels and turns the boosts on and off for me. And then nice. out of the effects, the effects send comes back to the board, goes into a Strymon Mobius, a uh, Boss DD500, and a TC Hall of Fame 2, um, and then goes back out to the return of the amplifier. If I'm running stereo, I can patch just into the pedals themselves rather than go through the connections on the board. And so I can still use the effects loops and manage to get that whole stereo thing kind of happening with it. So it takes a little bit of patching to do that, but it's not too bad. It's not too inconvenient to do that. So it's, it's the small Friedman. So I don't know what it is. It's what, 20 by... 15 or something, 24 by 15. So it's a pretty compact board. It's packed tight. If I didn't have the switcher on there, I wouldn't be able to run it really. I wouldn't be able to get my feet in there and turn everything on and off, but it's, it's pretty compact. I want to talk to you more about the ES five. I, I am so curious about like getting involved. Like, so basically I was, I was bound and determined to get an ES eight. I was like, I'm definitely getting one of those. Uh -huh. Then I played with one and I got scared. I was like, this might be too much power for me. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, I was, and unfortunately I hadn't ordered one yet, so I didn't, you know, didn't totally shoot right. myself in the foot there, but I've been s slowly kind of getting back and I'm like, maybe I should try the five. Like you, you, you really enjoy yours. Yeah. I have an ES8 too. When I was doing a lot more pedal stuff, I had, uh, I had the ES8 and I was using all the loops and, and, uh, yeah, man, the, the ES5, I, I find the boss really easy to get around on. It's easy to program. You just set what loops are on and which ones are off. And I've also got it turning the channel, switching between the two channels on the amp, and there's two different boosts and a reverb on and off you can control also. And so there's six functions on the amp I can control with foot switch, and I can control four of those from the ES5. That's uh, so, so I cool. program that for a patch. And then there's a MIDI out, and that changes the programs on the Mobius and the DD500. I uh, mean, that's really just program change message, pretty simple. So I mean, once you kind of figure it out, there's really only a couple of things you have to set per patch. And um, the way that I do it is, is I kind of set up a basic patch that like puts me on the clean channel with no effects, no nothing, just straight into the amplifier. And then I copy that to the other locations and then set, okay, I want the overdrive on on this one and I want the delay on on this one. And I want, you know, I just kind of do it step by step that way. But I start from a basic one 
and then just copy it and modify it as I go. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just had a, a, a question come into my head that, that, that might not be a fair question for you, but okay. I feel like, I feel like if I didn't ask it, it would be, it, I would be a missed opportunity. Um, so you you are obviously a gear head on every level from <laughs> from the pedals to the recording end of it. Like you are right. you you are a gear head. What is the like either I don't I shouldn't say it's best because that's that's not good. What is the most surprising thing you've ever gotten to play as a result of you know what you do for a living? Wow, I've never anything been asked. St- that. Yeah, anything like yeah, anything like stick out. Like I remember this one time, this Les Paul came through. You know, because I I definitely have guitar experiences like that, and you have a lot more of them. So I, I imagine there's a couple special moments in there. Man, that that is a interesting question. I have to think about that one a little bit. I mean, I've I've had. Oh, well, man, I'd have to think about that, but I'll tell you a, a story about something like that. So I, I was invited out to the Martin factory to do a tour of the the factory and to see what they do there or whatever. And after we were finished, we were sitting in this conference room just talking and they brought in a few guitars just to check out, pick up and play. And um, one of the ones they brought in was this limited edition model they had done. It was the anniversary of this magazine called Sing Out. It was a folk magazine and, and it was a Pete Seeger model. So it's a 12 string baritone guitar, Right. And so I strum this guitar and it's like, I can't believe it. This thing is unbelievable. It just, I, I've never played anything like this guitar in my life. And I'm like, I got to have it. I, you know, I, I'll, I, I'll go home and sell something. Just tell me what it is. What do I got to do to get this guitar? <laughs> like, yes. Sorry, it's not for sale. We're only making a hundred of these and, uh, or whatever it was, 120, maybe it was. And, uh, sorry, you can't, you can't have it. I, I think they're all gone or whatever. And, and so I'm like, oh man, you know, that's the one that I knew that for like years to come, I'd be like, uh, I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to forget that guitar. So fast forward yeah. about a month later and uh, I'm in the demo room at the music, the retail store at Sweetwater. And I see this big 12 string hanging on the wall. It's the exact same guitar that I played in the, in the uh, conference room at Martin guitar. It is that guitar. No for way. Sale at- for sale at Sweetwater. And so I bought that guitar and, and, uh, and, uh, man, it's it the most amazing guitar. So it's tuned down to B. So it's a 12 string acoustic guitar tuned down to B and it has an oversized body and it sounds like nothing you've ever heard, man. It is, it is a, it is just incredible. But that, that was, that was a crazy, so yeah, a crazy cool. Year. Yeah. And in fact, wow. I've had, I had a guy come over, uh, from another man from microphone manufacturer came over to the house and we were just hanging out and he picked it up and strummed it. And he's like, next morning he went in Sweetwater and bought another one. <laughs> that we have gotten in there. <laughs> and, uh, and he has in his will when he dies there's a certain person who gets it who played it who couldn't get one and they're like when you die i want that guitar i don't care what i have to do <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so if you ever get a chance to check those out man those martin baritones they also made a six string version which i've never seen but they did a six string baritone acoustic as well it's, it's a pete seeger model and it has like a triangular sound hole um, oh weird interesting yeah, it is weird but it man it, it sounds unbelievable it's an amazing instrument so, I've been getting know, that, that, really that kind of story, right? That is exactly what I was looking for. That is exactly the kind of story I was I was hoping you would tell me. Um oh, cool. especially because I've been really into baritones lately. I oh, I, I have a cup a couple of them and I just I'm so obsessed. I I I don't know why. I think it's like it's, it almost feels like a different instrument. I play it so much differently than I do a standard tuned standard, you know, six string guitar. I almost right. feel like a different player, not better yeah. or worse, just just different. Yeah. And and like the sounds, different. yeah, the sounds you can conjure out of a baritone. I don't know if you've ever plugged a baritone tuned to like, like B into a DS one, but it's like it's not even the same pedal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, a DS one's the greatest distortion of all time. Apparently, now that I plug this baritone into it, it's so crazy. Yeah. Such a great well, there's thing. something about shifting. I don't know if, you know, you're tuned to fourth down, so I don't know if that changes all the harmonics and the way the guitar rings or what it does, but it does make a difference. You're right. Yeah. And and then, well, since we're talking baritones, at NAM at Summer NAM, I played this baritone by Grez Guitars. He's a builder out of uh, California. And yep. it was, a, it was a, a baritone. I can't remember what it was tuned to, but I can't get it out of my head. It had gold foils in it. And oh. that combination... I never would have thought it would have sound, sounded good. It sounded incredible. I've never heard a guitar that sounded like that before. It's, it's nice. bananas. Check that out. That's cool. Yeah. 
yeah, check out Grail's guitars. They're on Instagram. They're all over the place. He's going to do the show at some point too. So, okay, he'll he he'll get around. I'll watch for that. Yeah. Okay, we're getting close to the to the uh, to the hour mark, and I think I think these last couple of questions will fill up that time nicely. And this is going to be a this is this this next one. I'm really excited to see what your answer is because I feel like I feel like this is a, this is going to be another difficult question possibly. Oh boy, no pressure. What is your favorite? What is your favorite boss pedal? My favorite boss pedal? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. I, I have I have owned a ton of boss pedals. Um, I have an original CE2 uh, that I bought when I was just starting out as a player. And I've, I've got an original uh, uh, DM uh, analog delay. Uh, I've got an, orig- an original um, Dimension C also. So I've Ooh. got that first generation of those, of those pedals. And... Uh, I now have the Waza versions of those as well, and the, I've got a DD500, I've got the MD500, and I've got the RV500 uh, volume pedals. I mean, I've just got a ton of Boss pedals. I, I like Boss pedals a lot. Um, the one that's living on my board is the DD500, just because it's so functional for me and does right. so much stuff. But um, man, if I had to pick just one, if I could only have one, It would either be the CE2 or the Dimension C. Um, mm-hmm. There's just something about that Dimension C, that multi-analog chorus that is just, man, I, that would probably be it. I, I just, that is the craziest pedal. I just, I love that pedal, both in mono, but man, in stereo, it is, you have to hear it to believe it. It's just so lush. Um, and then just having the, the push buttons means you don't have to mess with knobs or anything. It just kind of does what it does, but it, it does it really well. That, that's a really fun pedal. I like that pedal a lot. Yeah, I never thought I would jones for a pedal that I that basically, for all intents and purposes, doesn't really have much control. Like usually, right. I want to be able to tweak all of the parameters as intensely and and as to my heart's content. And uh, but that pedal, for some reason, it's like I just I do I love the idea of just clicking the button. And I think it is because they the dimensions sound so good. It's like, what do I want to mess with it for? It sounds right. it sounds perfect. Right. Um, they, yeah. They really, they I feel like, hit an unknown, uh, unexpected home run with that pedal. I, yeah. Well, yeah. The uh, the original. It was interesting. I did a actually, I did a video for Sweetwater where I compared the original that I own and the new Waza version, um, and that's pretty interesting because the, I think the biggest difference between them is the buffer that's in the pedal. The one that's in the new Waza one is a little bit cleaner and more transparent. Uh, the one that the original one is a little bit more colored. Uh, and so it's just kind of a choice. They both sound great. They both sound phenomenal. And you kind of choose which one. If you want a more transparent kind of a thing, the new one is really, really good. Good to know, because the old ones are hard to find. I uh, and- I haven't got to play much of the Waza, the Waza line. I have I have played the Waza Metal Zone, though, because of, mm-hmm. well, because I'm wearing a Metal Zone T-shirt right now. Why wouldn't you play the, <laughs> the Waza Metal Zone? Of course. Um. Let's see. Uh, that was that actually went quicker than I thought. I thought oh, I've that. that question. That question has been a interesting one. Like for me, like if somebody was to ask me, I would I would have to sit there and ponder that for a while. Uh, but yeah. A lot of the guests seem to just they that they, they have an instant favorite. Most of the guests are like, yeah, I like the PS3 or I like the OD1. And like, oh, you just know this is like I think yeah. everybody just in, instinctively knows this better than I better than I had given them credit for. Um, I, I think too that um, those those pedals have become man. The past few years, they put out some great stuff. We talked about the ES5 and the ES8, and I, I just man, my rigs are centered around those. So if you want to, if you if you mean by which is the most functional Boss pedal you've ever owned, that ES5 is like the heart of my whole rig. Like I said, it changes the amp channels, it changes MIDI on the effects, it switches the effects in and out. I mean, it it does so much for me that if you want to talk about which one's the most functional for me, it's probably that one. But even stuff like the new SY1, their little synth pedal, I think that thing is mm-hmm. awesome. I've got an SY, I've got an SY300, and it's great. I love playing with it. But like you were saying earlier, there's something about being able to just click the knob and it sounds good. Click the knob and it sounds good. Click the knob and it sounds good. That uh, that's really refreshing and kind of I, I find the more I do this allows me to um, keep my mind more on playing mm-hmm. and, and less less on editing and that kind of stuff. I mean, I value that too. But uh, for performance and stuff, my goal has been to streamline as much as possible. And uh, so I guess, you know, from that standpoint, the S5 is really the solution for me because I, I can get through my set with my EP um, and the songs that I do around that um, with basically five sounds is really all I need. 
depending on, on what songs I'm calling up or whatever. So just that ES5 is like the heart of the whole thing. It makes it so easy. Speaking of awesome boss products, have you gotten to play with the tube amp expander that much? I have one sitting in front of me and my Fuchs is running through it right now, actually. Oh, there you go. I mean, that just looks like one of the coolest and most useful pieces of gear I've seen come out in the last five years. Like such an awesome, I mean, over engineered beast of a product. But is it, it as good as it so seems? Much, yeah. it, it is. It does so much that that you really kind of got to you got to kind of ponder what all you're going to use it for, you know, in your what it's going to be good for in your situation. I mean, it takes such a different approach. I also have an ox um, and I've used the uh, the. Uh, uh, the Tone King Iron Man 2, I think, is another really good attenuator. Um, but the boss takes a different approach because it has its own power amp, right? So your whole amplifier is really just a tone generator. And then it, it uses its own internal 100-watt amp to drive the speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that 16 different reactive loads that you can dial up on that make a huge difference in how it feels. And I talked about really early on when we were talking, you know, that it's a combination of feel and tone for me to be able to totally. play. And uh, that reactive load in the, the boss is so flexible and so versatile. You can dial it exactly where you want. But with, man, with all the effects on board and the different functionality, like you said, I mean, it, it's really hard to beat, especially for a live situation. Uh, I mean, I, I'm debating whether I may use that some with the big amp at some of these smaller gigs just because it, it works. Yeah, uh, you just made me want it more now. That's not that's not good. <laughs> that's just what I want to just what I need is more gear, more gear, yeah, more right, gear. Right. I'm going to buy all the gear in the world. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, seems like what I'm trying to do. I'm not, I'm not actually trying to do that. But if you were to ask my wife or my family, they would probably disagree. <laughs> no, he wants to buy all of the gear. Yeah, it's tough because there's so many cool things out there and just sorting through all of them and finding the right stuff is, is a big part of the journey. It is. And then when you're in a, when you're in the industry, it's even worse because you know about most of it or seeming like right. you seem like you know about most of it. And you're like, ooh, shiny object syndrome. That looks cool. Yes. Let's go over there and see what that is. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There's always something oh, new to man. check out. Always. Always. All right. This is uh, this is the big one. This is the question okay. that uh, that has made or made or broke many different people. What kind of pizza do you like? <laughs> <laughs> um man well uh my wife and i are trying to eat really clean so i'm not eating much pizza these days but um of course i lived in new york and mm -hmm. uh, i was a so if you're looking for specifics in new york i was a fan of patsy's which is a coal-fired pizza they had a couple of different locations there it's a, the traditional thin crust new york kind of pizza which is just uh you know love it uh Yes. Doesn't need much on it. Maybe a little pepperoni, maybe some mushrooms. That's about it. But, uh, oh. I'm also a huge fan of Chicago pizza and we're very close to Chicago. I can be downtown in three hours from here in Fort Wayne. And uh, there are of course, endless great pizza opportunities there. My favorite in Chicago is Lou Malnati's, uh, which uh, man, I, I just love Lou's. <laughs> so uh, get some, you know, they uh, get some sausage and, and maybe some peppers and mushrooms and ooh, that, that's a, that's a good lunch right there. <laughs> that is a, that is something Chicago style pizza is not something that I can give a valid opinion on yet. I'll make fun of it on the internet occasionally right. for being a casserole, but I actually don't, I've never been to Chicago and I've never consumed their pizza. Oh man. So I can't, I can't out. actually have a valid, uh, I can't have a valid opinion on, on the Chicago style. I just love pizza. But if I, if I, you know, if I'm in New York, it's got to be New York pizza. If I'm in Chicago, it's got to be Chicago pizza. Otherwise, I like a, a wood-fired kind of a Neapolitan kind of pizza. And I, I keep threatening my wife that I'm going to build a pizza oven in the backyard because uh, I so, just love pizza. Let me tell you about something. Uh, All right. <laughs> let me tell you about a little device called the Uni. Uh, I've seen it. Yes. So some listeners got together because this is this is a question that gets asked on pretty much every episode. Uh, <laughs> the listeners got together and, uh, and got me one for my, my birthday a couple years ago. And yeah. I love it. It's, it's, it takes some getting used to it. Take, it's definitely not something you, you your first pizza is probably not going to turn out most likely. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. but once you get used to it and you get a hand on it or a handle on it, excuse me, it's, it's great. And they're not, they're not nearly as expensive as buying as making that dedicated leap to like 
buying or building a legit like brick pizza oven. Um, yeah. The, the unis are really a nice kind of uh, a nice in between for the, the pizza enthusiast at home. Yeah, I, I, I really like mine. Yep. It's a, a gateway oven, right? It's a gateway <laughs> oven and it uses the same pellets that my Traeger does. So there you go. Yeah, I, you know, I, okay. I've seen those and I've looked at those and I've always been a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, skeptical of it. But all right. You, I think you sold me. So there, you sold me something today. OK, well, there at least <laughs> that's not what I intended to do. But all right. You sold me a tube amp expander. And <laughs> there you go. That's fair is fair. Fair is fair. Fair is fair. But yeah, the uni is cool. I will say I wish I, I if I was going to buy one myself, I probably would have gotten the bigger one. But um, also, if you're just experimenting, the small one is nice because um, you, just because you don't have to like dedicate like you can you could afford to mess up a couple pizzas in the small one with the big one. It's a little bit more of a loss. Uh, I wouldn't want to play it, play with it as much as the little one. You can kind of, you can put sandwiches in there. You can put all kinds of things in there. It's a, they're a great little, little device and they all look right, cool. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out. So. All right, man. Well, where, this is your chance to plug anything you want to plug where, where can people find you? Where they, can they find your music or anything else you want to send them to? Oh man. Uh, well, of course there's all the, uh, the Sweetwater videos at YouTube. Uh, you can, you can check me out there. I've got a uh, Facebook page and, uh, also my website, mitchgallagher.com. My EP came out, it's called foundation came out about a year ago. Uh, there's a bunch of reviews around the web and things if you want to read about it before you listen to it, but it's on Spotify, Apple music, iTunes, uh, Amazon, uh, CD baby. You can buy it direct off my, uh, off my, uh, website if you like. And so, uh, so that's pretty much around there. And I'm hopefully going to be moving into a new EP here. Um, probably, hopefully in the next few months, I want to get started recording something new again. I've been writing. So, uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to getting started with that new project, but, um, uh, books are available at, uh, bookshops, Amazon, Sweetwater, all those kind of places as well. And so yeah, you can find me all those places. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was a, this was a really good chat. I knew it was going uh, to be, but you know. Hey, it was fun. I'm glad it happened. Oh, it was, yeah, it was a blast, man. I, I appreciate you inviting me on. It was a lot of fun, and uh, I'm going to listen to it. I'm kind of curious what I sound like. You sound good. You got, you got a good <laughs> you got a good rig over there. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds it sounds really nice. I can tell you because I've been, you know how I know because I've been listening to you for an hour. That's how I know it sounds. Well, there good. you go. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's an, <laughs> SM, it's an SM7B into an Apollo Twin interface. So there you go. There you go. I might need to replicate that. <laughs> That's right. Put it beside the tube amp expander. Yes, there you go. All right, everybody. For Mitch, this is Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. All right, folks, we did it again. Another episode in the can. And if you want more of that, guess what? Mitch and I sat down for some extra time over on Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash tone mob, you can see there's like, I don't remember... 50 or 60 episodes now up over there that are all exclusive for the Patreon folks. So if you want access to all that stuff, and as well as new bonus content every week, that's where you go. You go to patreon.com slash tone mob, and for as little as $5 a month, you too can get extra content beamed right to your ears. And like the classic podcaster thing to say, that's less than a fancy coffee, and you get a ton of extra content if this is the type of thing you enjoy. So that's the place to go get it. Don't forget to check out all Mitch's stuff, all his music. It's really, really a great record. And you know where to find Sweetwater. Go check him out. You're going to find Mitch out there on the internet. He's on the internet. On the internet. He's been doing it a long time. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening this far. And thanks for being awesome. Later. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings 
just for your guitar and playing style. Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.